Hello, welcome to the Lone Show. I'm your host, John Lone, and this episode, no regulars, because reasons, as always, I guess. As for our guest, he is from Chicago, Illinois, currently in Austin, Texas. He's a writer and real estate appraiser. Oh, now that's interesting. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Douglas Burton. Hi, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, it's so, an interesting combination, huh? <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. So, how's life? Life is good and busy. Um, I've got two little guys and a lot of baseball tournaments this summer and, of course, still trying to write and uh, keep up with all my uh, my writing. So, it's, it's a full-time job from multiple fronts. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's- is there anything you're currently working on at the moment or up to recently? Yes. Uh, so I, I just finished The Heroine's Labyrinth, which we'll be talking about tonight. But I am also currently working on writing the sequel to my first book, which is a historical fiction novel about uh, a Byzantine empress, Empress Theodora. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> So uh, a lot of a lot of work goes into that. A lot of research goes into that, and uh, really, due to the research, it takes a lot of time to synthesize the ideas and put them into to chapters that feel very, you know, like like they flow and are natural and comfortable and believable. So it it takes some time. It sure does. <laughs> what inspired you to become an author? Well, I, uh, I've always enjoyed writing and uh, I enjoy art in general. I uh, had done, you know, pencil, charcoal and paint art when I was a, a child or a kid, I guess. Uh, but writing really is where I, I gravitated. I, I like to express myself and I like the idea of articulating complex ideas or thoughts or uh, emotions, anything like that, and putting it down and, and giving some clarity to it. Uh, in terms of story or ideas. And so I really stuck to writing and I, I used to like to write science fiction and fantasy, but I always had a real affinity for Byzantine history just because it's so obscure. It seems uh, it, it, there's not a lot of uh, uh, people who talk about it or think about it. There's almost no movies that take place in the Byzantine empire. So I've always just been fascinated with it. So when I felt like my writing skills were ready, uh, I set myself the task of writing a book that takes place in the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, I definitely understand that. It's very underrated this time of year. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So in terms of your recently recently released book, what's the what goes on specifically? So while I was writing the first book, which it's called Far Away Bird, and it's uh, a historical fiction book about Byzantine Empress Theodora. And when it comes to writing, a lot of writers have different strategies on how to organize their story. Uh, You can get lost in the woods, so to say, if you wing it too much. I know because it happened to me. Um, I didn't have any initial structure to the story. And so I wrote 500 pages and got lost in the woods and the story was not set up properly. And so I really began to study story structure. And uh, while, and the big, the big thing in story structure out there, and it has been for a long time is uh, something called the hero's journey, which is a, a pattern that takes place in multiple stories uh, such as Lord of the Rings, the Lion King, and even more famously, Star Wars. Uh, and this story structure, although the, the patterns might repeat, the expressions are vastly different in each story. And I found that fascinating. So, and I studied the hero's journey for quite a while, decades, in fact. And when I went to write Far Away Bird on Empress Theodora, I blindly trusted the hero's journey to help me organize the story. And uh, it became apparent to me early on, maybe about a third of the way through that the hero's journey was not going to work uh, for Empress Theodora. 
And uh, one of the criticisms of the hero's journey is that it has kind of a male centrism to it. So I was like, well, maybe that's why this is not working for my female protagonist. Um, so I researched a feminine, a feminine version or something that might uh, be the equivalent to the hero's journey uh, for, for female characters. And I, I found a lot of material out there and some of it was quite compelling, but I didn't find anything as concise and as usable and as accessible as the hero's journey was for me in the past. So I started my own little side research project of studying hero and centric stories to get some ideas if there were any patterns that were comparable to the hero's journey, but different. And uh, lo and behold, I began to uncover some uh, different patterns and some different angles and perspectives. And uh, I, I ended up creating a whole bunch of notes that created an alternative structure um, that was not the hero's journey, that was very different in marked ways. And um, the more I started to share them with other writers, they're like, you need to, uh, you need to tell people about this, that there's nothing else like this. Uh, and so I spent the next four years uh, doubling down and uh, writing the book that came out now. And uh, that book is called The Heroine's Labyrinth, Archetypal Designs in Heroine-Led Fiction. That was quite a project. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. You were so, so much. I can definitely tell it's quite a project. It's yes. definitely worth uh, it. Yes, it, it, it became a labor of love. Uh, I never thought I would be working on something like this. But um, the more I, I sensed that th there was something there, and I began to put it down and also share it with other people and discuss it with other writers, the more encouraged I became to just keep going. And uh, so I watched films and television shows that had female leads. I went back and read all the classics uh, that had female leads uh, and even some current books and uh, even a comic book or two. And um, uh, I was just surprised to find this, uh, this pattern so recurrent uh, in, in so many different genres and varieties. So I just did the work to try to explain it all. And my goal was to help other writers. Um, you know, if it worked for me, then my hope is that it will work for other writers as well. Sounds good, sounds good. Are there any authors that you would like to collaborate with at some point? Oh, wow. <sighs> that I would like to collaborate with. Well, it's always, um, so in the world of writing, um, it's always kind of a, a, a strange thing for the collaboration, you know, the big collaboration, because every writer is kind of have every writer has their own styles and habits and uh, the writing is a little bit different and everything. So it's always like a big ask, <laughs> you know, to be like, Hey, let's work on a project together. Cause you, you, you don't know, it's like a marriage. You don't know if it's going to work or not, you know? Um, but you know, if, if I ever could work with an, another author, I think it would be cool to work with Christopher Vogler who did, a comparable book that's very famous, it's world renowned, called The Writer's Journey. And uh, he was the one who really broke down the hero's journey and made it accessible for writers. Uh, he did this back in the 1990s and really set the tone and advised many of the Hollywood studios on how to construct stories along these lines. So I, I think it would be fun to work with him and, and create a new book that works on both the hero's journey and the heroine's labyrinth and offers usable, practical advice for, for screenwriters, novelists, and uh, even memoirists. That sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> Are there any other jobs or opportunities you haven't done yet that you would like to try someday? Whew. Well, yes. Uh, at some point, it would be, I would like to try screenwriting. Uh, but for the time being, I'm still working on my craft as a, as a novelist. I, I tend to like to, to, to break out the ideas and really explore them. So a, a screenplay is really focused on the dialogue and, and the movement of the story. But I think it would be, a, a, a great exercise to see how well you can move a story along uh, by focusing on character dialogue. But also, um, it's quite a craft in and of itself. So that would be an area of expansion for sure. 
Sounds good. If you were to host a dinner party and you could invite five guests who were either dead or alive, who would you invite? Oh, my Lord. Dead or alive? Dinner party, five guests. <clears throat> I would like to invite uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and George Lucas. They would have a seat at uh, the table for sure. Um, Steven Spielberg, uh, one of the great storytellers of my generation, uh, when I was a kid, <clears throat> hmm, would be the other two. That is a good question. Maybe Leo Tolstoy. He's one of my favorite novelists, uh, Russian novelist. Uh, I really like his stories and they're, they're done in a, in a Russian style, which is very different from Western writers. Uh, and, and his books tend to really stick with you. Uh, I would love to talk to him. And <clears throat> lastly, the last seat. Hmm. Who would the last seat go to? That's a good one. You know, I would have to say William Shakespeare. I would love to see him at the table. That group would be an interesting group to get together right there. <laughs> yeah. Writers and storytellers uh, of different stripes there. That'd be that'd be a fun group. <laughs> yes. All sorts of ideas will certainly come off from that. Oh yeah. I mean something would come out of that, right? <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. What could you give a 40 minute presentation on without any preparation? At this point, the hero in's labyrinth. Um, I would love to. I love discussing it, and um, I could talk. I have talked about it for six hours <laughs> on um, like YouTube live streams. Uh, but that does have like a chat, and there's some interaction there. <clears throat> um, but I also recently discussed it at the San Diego Writers Festival, and that was about a 40 minute presentation. I think it actually went 45 minutes. And um, then there was a 15 minute Q&A, but I, I could talk. It's like I said, it's become a labor of love. So it's become a passion of mine. And so there's so much information that I have that I do enjoy talking about it. And uh, if you press go, uh, I can go on for 40 minutes. No problem. <laughs> Sweet. If you could know the complete and absolute truth to one question, what question would you ask? Hmm, the complete and absolute truth about any question. Yes. Well, I feel like if you ask too big of a question, it's uh, almost uh, dangerous. You know, it's dangerous to have too much knowledge on something. Maybe uh, who shot JFK? I want to know. I want to know what's going on there. The biggest conspiracy of all time. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's a boiling one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh huh. Where was the furthest you traveled to from where you were originally from? Uh, while I was living in Orlando, Florida, I traveled to Istanbul, and uh, that was the furthest I've ever been. Um, I've been to several countries, but I think Istanbul would represent the furthest. I've ever gone Panama. I don't. Yeah, I think Istanbul's got to be the furthest. I, I went there because uh, of my love of uh, the Byzantine Empire, and uh, it was the ancestral and ancient capital of uh, the Byzantine Empire when it was Constantinople. Um, but now it's Istanbul, and we know that. Uh, but I went there and I, I saw several of the sites there, and uh, Istanbul is a beautiful, beautiful city. And the people were wonderful and warm. And I had such a good time there. And uh, just sitting on a rooftop, looking out and seeing the, the domes and the minarets. Uh, they, do, they have prayer songs there, I think, five times a day. And uh, it's quite something to sit there and take all of that in. That, that's something that you don't really see uh, in the West. So uh, it, it was quite an experience. Yes, and of course, Quite and of rarity. course, it's surrounded by water on all sides. So you get this beautiful stripe of water uh, just surrounding you, and there's ships out there uh, in in kind of a queue waiting to go uh, into harbor. Uh, you know, I mean, to this day, that's still a very high, highly trafficked transit point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Who was the last person you've talked to? The last person I talked to, like in general or in a deep combo? Anything. Anything? Uh, my wife. Uh, we were discussing uh, the Heroines Labyrinth, and we were discussing kind of what uh, <clears throat> what our hopes were for it, and uh, hoping uh, to promote it. And you know, we we'd love it if if people found it to be a, especially writers, to found it to be a useful. Um, a useful tool for them to, to organize their story. So we were talking about that and um, you know, the, uh, the, the upcoming podcast, this one right here, uh, this is actually my first podcast. I have gone on live on YouTube multiple times, but I had never done a podcast before. So this was the first one. And we were talking about that as well. Okay. That's, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where do you see yourself 20 years from now? 20 years from now, my kids would be grown up. Well, I guess I would say I would be a proud, happy father and husband that my kids grew up and were successful. And um, I guess I would still like to be in the same house. I always had this idea that it would be wonderful to have the same place for the kids, you know, grow, you know, a even after they've grown up, uh, the same home to come home to. Um, you know, a home base, even after, you know, once they start their foray into adult life. Uh, and then, you know, taking trips uh, with my wife all around the world, that would be, that'd be, and sometimes with the kids or, uh, or a uh, friends or other family members, I think that'd be a, a blast to have that kind of time on my hands to be able to go do that again. Um, you know, I was able to do it in my twenties, you know, to go see the world a little bit. Uh, it was like I retired up front. And then I settled in to do my work, <laughs> start a career, start a family. And uh, now there's really no time for, uh, for that. But I am hoping in 20 years that that changes and I'm able to enjoy life uh, on that level again. That would be a blast. Indeed. <laughs> if you were going to sail all across the globe, what would be the name of your boat? The name of my boat? Well... I guess the SS Hemingway, he was kind of a, a nautical man himself and uh, was well known down there in the Florida Keys. Uh, so uh, that would be a good name for a boat. And I'd be very proud of that. And uh, <clears throat> it'd be a cool thing to be out on the ocean at night and pour a couple glasses of wine and sit on the top of the boat and stare up at the stars, uh, you know, weather permitting, of course. I think that'd be nice. Yeah. Indeed, yes. Or, or to read a book in the deep sea, or out there, uh, out there in the surrounded by ocean on all sides and no land in sight. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Have you ever met anyone famous? Um, met and talked to. Yeah, I mean, I've met. <laughs> I met Peyton Manning and Derek Jeter at the same time. Uh, those are the, you know, uh, sports figures. Uh, they had just done a commercial together and happened to be at the exact same bar I was in. And uh, it was just bizarre looking over and seeing them. And uh, of course I went over and bought them a beer and they were gracious to accept. Uh, but I left them alone after that. Um, and I don't know if I met anybody, you know, uh, above that necessarily. Um, funny enough, a buddy of mine, cause we're in Austin, Texas. And, uh, he just told me yesterday <clears throat> he took his son to a monster truck rally and he was sitting two feet. He's like Doug shoulder with Elon Musk. Elon Musk showed up unannounced and, uh, was sitting right next to him. <laughs> he, he was going on about how bizarre that is. So that doesn't really qualify for me, but it's on my mind. Cause it was just told to me. And, uh, you know, M Musk being a, a multi-billionaire, one of the world's most richest men, that's quite a, quite a thing. But for me, I don't know if I met anybody else uh, extremely famous before um, where I got to rap with them or talk with them or anything like that. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. What was the largest thing you have ever witnessed? Like size-wise? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I I would I would have to say the Grand Tetons, uh, which uh, is a mountain range. It's 
one of the largest mountain ranges on the continental United States. And back in 1992, my dad and I climbed it. And uh, we had to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning in order to get it done. And so we can get up there and down uh, at, the, at the right time. And it's real cold and dark in the morning and you're tired and you got to be careful when you're a lot of it's hiking, but you do get to points where you have to scale and ascend uh, the mountain. And once you get up there and you get a view, you can see, I believe, four states uh, from the top of the Grand Tetons. And uh, I, it was one of the first times I realized that my camera was absolutely useless because no matter where I aimed it and snapped a picture, it was capturing just one small square of the vision I had, which was roughly, you know, 6% of what I could look at with the naked eye. And uh, so I would have to say that mountain, that mountain range, which is part of the Rocky Mountains there, uh, largest thing I've ever seen. And it was beautiful. Oh, yes. It certainly was. It. Yeah, that was worth it. <laughs> that was amazing. Nice. If you could get an exotic pet, what kind of companion would you like to have? An exotic pet? Well, I think it would be cool to have something like uh, like a jaguar, like one of those uh, big wild cats, of course, that would be tamed and declawed. Uh, assuming, of course, that the... Uh, <clears throat> like the, Or I guess a leopard. I think a leopard is what I'm thinking of. Not so much a jaguar. But... Uh, um, Assuming, of course, the leopard was uh, wanting to live uh, with with and amongst humans, uh, I think that would be cool. Um, I don't know what it is about those animals, but I find them to be both exotic uh, and quite beautiful. And uh, interestingly enough, when I was at the San Diego Zoo uh, for that writers' festival a couple months ago, um, we saw some leopards, and they were very active. A lot of times at zoos, the animals are very uh, restful. You know, they're not as act- And these two were very active. They were like play fighting with each other. And and just the way they move and jump around, even in play, was uh, pretty striking. So, yeah, I think a, a leopard would be awesome. Fabulous. Would you rather speak all languages or talk to animals? Hmm. I would rather speak all languages. Um, and that would be a tough choice because I would also like to, to speak to all animals. But um, I think probably because I'm a writer, I have an almost inborn desire to, to talk and communicate with people. So if I could speak all languages, that would remove a significant barrier between myself and every single person on the planet. So that would be quite something to have that ability and to go anywhere in the world and to be able to strike up a conversation and talk to them and get to know that person. And I can't even imagine what it would do, what, what that would do to broadening your understanding of not only the world, but of uh, human beings and humanity in general, uh, what, what that would do to your perspective. That would have to be pretty profound. Yeah. Can't argue with that. <laughs> if you were chosen to colonize a new habitable planet, would you take the offer? Um, if it happened to me right now, I would have to say no, because I've got my kids. Uh, I, I, I couldn't leave them uh, for, for any reason. However, uh, if they were grown and uh, you know, I, was, I had an empty nest here at the house, I might pitch it to my wife and be like, hey, uh, Mars has some uh, condo space, and I think we should take it. So, yeah, I, I would go, but it, I would have to feel like uh, I have that I was there for my kids when they needed me most, and uh, then I would I would take that offer. That would be pretty cool. And as you mentioned, I'm a real estate appraiser, so they have got to need real estate appraisers uh, on Mars, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're still buying and trans, you know, buying and selling real estate, right? How much is it worth? I'll, I'll help you out with that. It'd be worth trillions of dollars. Apparently. It would be worth a lot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, why not later? Yeah. Do, it, do it now. Yeah, I, I mean, if that's what it's worth, just all I'm asking is 1% of the fee. That's it. Yeah, it's more than enough. Yeah, I mean, I'll get by on Mars, you know. Yeah, same. <laughs> would you teleport yourself 
500 years in the, into the future or 500 years into the past? Oh, man, that's a good question. So 500 years in the past would be the 1500s. Hmm. The Byzantine Empire collapsed in 1453. Um, I think you had the Spanish Empire and, and Britain and France and Portugal even contesting each other at that time. I guess in that circumstance, I'd rather go 500 years in the future uh, and hope to God that everyone is still here, uh, that <laughs> we're all still here and uh, that it was a, a worthy journey. It, it would be pretty fascinating to see what all this led to uh, after we kick off uh, this mortal coil. Um, God, 25, 2,500. God, I, I bet it would be very disorienting to go 500 years in the future. Uh-huh. Yes. It's, well, uh... if I spoke every language, though, I, I would have that helping me, <laughs> at least. Yeah. Would you sleep on the wall or sleep on the ceiling? I would sleep on the ceiling because that's wild. Um, I've been on a, a carnival ride that spins you, so I've stuck to a wall before, uh, and that's fun. But I don't think I've done anything uh, at all like stick to a ceiling. So I, I would like to do that. I, I would sleep on the ceiling. All right, then. <laughs> Honestly, I'd go for the ceiling, too, because you have all the floor space to yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, exactly. You, you, you Imagine what that would do for the spaciousness of your room. That'd be incredible. Yes. <laughs> It'd be quite it's it'll be quite a view that's for sure yeah and then when you go to bed you just tell people hey i'm heading up and i'll uh, see you guys in the morning fantastic <laughs> do you know a guy named joe uh yes i know a couple guys named joe okay um and i guess the question is which joe comes to mind off the top of my head um I guess I would say um, jo there's a there is a, a friend of mine, <laughs> Joe Mobilio. He was the first one that popped in there when you when you said the name Joe. So I guess that's the, the answer to the question. Uh, he was a real estate appraiser with me several years ago, and uh, we were roommates in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, it was a, a turbulent time in, in the real estate world. Uh, the housing market had collapsed and uh, he and I tried to. Uh, keep our sea legs under us, so to say. So uh, I have pretty, pretty strong memories of that time uh, of my life. And it was uh, me and Joe. <laughs> Fair enough. But what about Joe Mama? Oh, uh, yeah, that one for sure. That one, uh, that one was uh, mentioned several times when I was a kid. <laughs> yep. Can't argue with that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite a joke. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that is all. That is all we have for this episode. It's great having you on, Douglas, talking about your recent works and also real estate at some point. And wow, that's a lot of things we have discovered. And yeah, it's been great. Yeah, we covered a lot of ground in uh, the, the time we had. That was outstanding. Oh, yes. And until next time, stay tuned for more. <laughs>